As many of you know, we review a variety of products on our website, including soundbars. We've launched this silo in fall of 2019. Since then, we have reviewed 89 soundbars, with many more to come. What you may not know is that we review products according to our test benches, which are iterations of testing methodologies. When we first launched soundbar reviews, we tested them according to our initial test bench, 0.8. This beta test bench set the groundworks for our soundbar reviews, and since its launch, we've received feedback from users like you on how we can improve our testing and reviews. From this feedback, we developed soundbar test bench 1.0. And like all of our test bench updates, it aims to improve our testing methodology to help you find the best products for your needs. Hi, I'm Daigo, a tester at ratings.com, and today I'll be discussing our Sambon test bench 1.0 update. We'll look at the changes and improvements it brings over from previous methodology and what it means for our Sambon reviews moving forward. While you're here, make sure you subscribe to our channel for the latest videos or check out the website for the full change log. The Sambar Test Bench 1.0 was released in February 2021, and so far, we have gone back and retested over 35 Sambars that we previously reviewed to test them using this newer methodology, and we plan to retest all of our Sambars soon. Test Bench 1.0 brought forth many changes. In this video, we will cover the minor changes and then dive into the details for the bigger changes like how we test latency and all the issues we encounter developing this test. If you want to skip straight to a section, use the YouTube Chapters feature. Let's start with the smaller things. We now take dimension shots for the subwoofer and the satellite in the dimension box. We initially took these photos in our testing room beside tower speakers to give users a visual of how the subwoofer would look compared to a tower speaker. We found that using the dimension box was a better way to display the depth and height, and it also makes it standardized across all our silos. We also added the voice assistant box. In this box, you can see if the soundbar supports Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, or Apple Siri. We also mentioned if it's built in or if it uses your smartphone. We added this because some people love that they can just tell their soundbar to play the latest Mandalorian episode on TV, or set the timer and add items to the shopping list. On the other hand, those that are more privacy conscious might find it useful to have a list of soundbars that they should avoid. Lastly, we added the testing setup diagram that shows the active channel during the testing for stereo frequency response, center, surround 5.1, and height, atmos. Adding this visual will help you give more information about the testing setup for those respective boxes. We shifted our focus on 5.1 surround only since it's the most common surround content available at home. That means that rear satellites are now always in use during our 5.1 testing for 7.1 and 9.1 soundbars with only two satellites, when the soundbar allows it. The reason for this change was feedback from the community and it would be more representative of a user using these variations in their house. One of the biggest requests from users was to add a latency test. What is latency and why does it matter? Latency in a soundbar is a delay between the image of your TV and the audio coming out from your soundbar. When you have high amounts of latency, you can experience issues most noticeable in lip syncing. You'll notice that the voices don't match with lip movement. For gamers, latency is also important. If your audio and visuals are out of sync, this will put you at a disadvantage when playing against other players. While a wired connection can help you reduce this issue compared to a wireless connectivity option like Bluetooth, latency can vary depending on the wired connection you're using. Our latency test is measured over three wired connections. First, ARC, an HDMI connection that sends audio from TV back to your soundbar. Here, ARC refers both ARC and the newer eARC standards. Second, the optical, a fiber optic network cable that sends digital optical audio. Lastly, full HDMI in which unlike the ARC is a direct connection to an HDMI in port. For all three connections, we connect the same Samsung Q80T TV with the tested soundbar and wire connections in order to get comparable results. We set up a tripod with the camera phone five feet and nine inches away to film the results. We record the audio visual latency video 20% slower to more easily see the delay. This video has an audible ping that occurs once every second. Each ping should ideally be in sync with the moment the white ball touches the moving white platform at the bottom of the screen. At the same time, the left circle should alternate between green and white while the red circle appears on the right side. We measure latency in milliseconds, and we consider a good latency value to be between minus 55 to 75 milliseconds. No, negative latency does not mean that some fancy soundbar can make audio travel faster than light. 
but the way we measure latency is from the relative timing of audio and video. There's simply less latency from the audio than there is from the video. This can occur when the extra processing happens in the video. For example, some soundbars have an on-screen interface, and in some cases, it can delay the video, leading to lower audio latency. That said, latency can be measured in a positive or negative value. For example, the Vizio SB36 512F6 has an arc latency of 75 milliseconds. This positive value indicates that the visuals come before the sound. The same soundbar has a negative 85 millisecond value in its full HDMI connection. This indicates that the sound comes before the visual due to its negative latency. Between the two, it is easier to notice sound coming before the visual than the other way around. Also, when results are outside of a good latency range, you might start to experience noticeable delay. One of the challenges that we had at first while filming the latency video was that certain soundbars would go into a standby mode, if not playing constant noise. In order to fix this, we added a 15 Hz low frequency sound to the reference video we are using to keep soundbars active in order to record the latency measurements. It's important to mention that some apps and devices compensate for latency differently, so your real-world experience may vary. We test soundbars in our testing room, which is designated to mimic a typical living room, but with certain sound treatment. We start by placing the soundbar in front of the TV, one foot away from the screen. If there's a subwoofer, we place it eight inches from the front wall and the center of the sub four feet from the left wall. We then place the mic array, or how we call it in the office, miczilla, in the center of the room and ensure that we have the proper distance from the TV, the side walls, and the back walls using a laser distance measure to properly align it every time we test the soundbar. Once that is done, we run a sweep at tested volumes of 80 dB from 20 Hz to 20,000 Hz in order to generate a frequency response. Now the placement of the speakers and the sub is really important, as are the conditions such as the dimension and placement of your couch, etc. Using these fixed conditions for every soundbar does have a downside that it might not align with the way you set up your room, but it does allow for a fixed reference to compare all these products under the same conditions. In our room, for example, there is a room mode that causes bass buildup around 200 Hz. While you may not have modes of the same frequency, every room has resonance and the best soundbars have an auto calibration or tuning function that compensates for the modes in our room and your own. In our previous test bench 0.8, we tested the soundbar in stereo, center, surround, which is now surround 5.1, and height atmos with five different testing positions for the mic array. We have changed that from five to three since the results obtained with those two extra positions don't significantly impact the results we've obtained or make them more accurate. We'll talk about the benefits of these changes later, but before we get there, I want to give you a small crash course on the frequency response curve and how to read it. A frequency response curve is a curve that measures the speaker, headphones, or in this case, soundbar's ability to reproduce sound at different frequencies. This is also referred to as spectral balance. We can break this curve down into three main categories, bass, mid-range, and treble range, that each have three subcategories, low, mid, and high. Humans can hear starting approximately 20 Hz to 200 Hz in the bass, 200 Hz to 2000 in the mid-range, and 2000 to 20,000 in the treble. This is essentially the cornerstone of understanding and interpreting how the audio will sound on your device based on how the curve compares or looks. This is a big simplification, and if you are interested, we did a more in-depth explanation of the frequency response curve in regards to headphones in the video here. In short, the flatter the curve, the more neutral each of those frequencies are reproduced. Since now you can read a frequency response curve, we will talk about the components that affect the score of this curve, the slope and the standard error. As you can see, we have a targeted slope on our graph. This target slope is what we set as a reference that most users will appreciate. This profile puts an emphasis on the base range and puts less emphasis on the treble range. The slope is a derivative of the logarithmic fit or regression line of the frequency response, basically a straight line of the best fit on this graph. A positive slope indicates a treble heavy sound and a negative slope indicates a bass heavy sound. That said, our slope is not necessarily a perfectly neutral sound. After seeing our results, users can look to adjust the settings of the soundbar to their liking if the bar allows it. You can see our sound enhancement box to see all the settings that can be changed. This is where personal preference comes into play since some people might prefer more bass while others prefer less. 
In our previous time span, we scored the slope, but we removed it since there is no perfect value for everybody. It is largely up to your preference. However, we still show the value since we believe you can still find it helpful. The benefit of changing the five testing iterations to three is to reduce the testing from 80 down to 48 passes. Doing so, we now have allocated testing time to test preliminary calibrations on soundbars. The purpose of the preliminary calibration is to bring the slope that we talked about closer to zero without bringing the frequency response score down. If we didn't achieve the targeted slope from the threshold range of minus 0.15 to 0.15 after several iterations, we stop there and we use the default setting. It is important to note that our calibration is done in our testing room and will not apply to every room. However, it does show how tunable the soundbar is to tweak in the way you prefer. If we're able to tweak a soundbar to more easily match our reference curve, then you're likely more able to use these same settings for your preference. Now moving on to the standard error, which is the average deviation from a targeted curve. Like the slope, this can be adjusted by changing the sound settings of your soundbar. The higher the number, the less accurate the frequency response curve will be. On our frequency response graph, you will see that the bass range sits from 20 Hz to 200 Hz. In the low bass, you can find the low frequency extension, or LFE for short. The LFE value shows the lowest frequency that the soundbar can reproduce at a decent level. A low LFE is important for those who want an impactful sound, with rumbling in movies and explosion in games. Everyone uses a different reference point for the LFE, but most of them seem to agree that the first frequency that reaches minus 3 dB from a reference point in dB is the LFE. Others see it as the region where the bass falls towards zero in the frequency response graph. In our case, we use a curve and our score is based on this target curve. Since the value of the LFE was obtained at minus 3 dB from our target curve, it would cause some issues, especially when soundbars would have a more neutral profile with a bit less bass since the minus 3 dB would happen at a higher frequency even if the fall towards zero happened way earlier. This was the case for the Sonos Arc full setup. The LFE was influenced by changing the settings on the soundbar. For this test bench, we changed our reference point for the LFE to minus 6 dB from our target curve. This would be closer to the blue area where the bass would fall towards zero. Our LFE score did not change, but the way we obtained the value now is more representative of the base falloff. So what do you think of the new test bench? Is there anything that you'd like to see further improved? We're always looking for feedback from users like you on how we can improve our review. Let us know of any suggestions you have in the comments below or in the changelog page in our website. Speaking of test benches, we invite you to visit our website for other product categories we are testing. If you have any suggestions on what to improve, let us know below. Also, we are currently hiring in our offices in Montreal for various positions. So if you want to help people find the best products for their needs, have a look at our career page. You can check out all of our summer reviews on our website. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel or become an insider on the website for first access to our latest results. So that's it. Thank you for watching. See you next time.